going to need some scripture readers tonight, uh, if you wouldn't mind, and you'd be willing to do that. Um, let me see. Let me get to them so I can call them out to you. Um, all right. Somebody will be willing to read some scripture. All right. Uh, Diane, would you do 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9? Okay. Who else? All right. Rosemary, if you'll do Titus, that's a place you'll have a hard time finding. <laughs> Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. Sullivan. Bessie, would you do Romans 3, 23 and 24? Yes. All right. Some of these are short. Uh, somebody else? Okay, Blaine. Um, would you do Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? You probably could quote it. We'll actually read it before we get there, but when we get there, I'd like for you to read that one. Um, and then I need one more. It's a short one. All right, Marcia. Acts 15, 11. So Blaine's going to do Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Marcia's going to do Acts 15, 11. Uh, uh, Bessie's going to do Romans 3, 23 through 24. Rosemary's going to do Titus 3, 4 and 7. And Diane's going to do 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. All right. Um, these will be up on the screen when we get to it. And so they'll be up on the screen, the New King James. That's so that the people at home can see what they're not hearing from you. <laughs> but we'll talk about them anyway uh, when we get to them. All right. If you've got your Bibles tonight, y'all know where we are. Be finding the book of Titus. Uh, we've been studying the book of Titus now for a little bit. We're in the second chapter, and tonight we'll be in verses um, 11 through 14. Uh, so we're kind of moving right on, uh, 11 through 14. I, I mean, I can go ahead and add 15 if you want to, because that'll finish out the chapter. Um, but this is a short book in the Bible, just three chapters. So uh, we're going to get through Titus, you know, a little bit quicker um, so um, if you'll be finding that, that's where we're going to be. But have your Bible ready because we're going to be in several different places um, this evening. Um, let me kind of just throw out some things, kind of some reminders to you. Uh, maybe important tonight as we uh, kind of rehash some of the background material because um, especially the topic tonight, uh, we've, been, we've been titling the study um, on, on the book of Titus, um, tough grace in a difficult place. Um, and that title is going to kind of start to make more sense as we get into tonight's study, kind of on to the end of this study. You're going to see a big emphasis on grace, which, you know, just a Bible study on grace would be a tremendous Bible study. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about how grace works uh, and kind of use this passage of scripture. Before we get there, we're going to talk a lot about grace. Um, that's a word probably that um, is overused in some ways, and sometimes we have some mistaken notions about grace. Sometimes j grace is called cheap grace. That's a term that you've heard, and so we've heard lots of those things. But um, we need to understand some of the background, so we, uh, once again, we'll take a look at that tonight uh, so that we get why he's going to spend so much time now talking about grace uh, in the rest of the study. Um, remember that the little book of Titus is actually a letter that's written by um, Paul to one of his kind of young disciples, I guess we could say, in the ministry, Titus. Um, the letter is actually called a pastoral letter, if you'll remember, um, because it's, it's interesting. It's written to, some young pa to a young pastor. Uh, there's three pastoral letters in the Bible. Can you all name those? What are they? Right, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Those are the pastoral letters. And, of course, Timothy was another one of the young disciples of Paul in the ministry. He was pastoring at Ephesus when Paul wrote the letter, First and Second Timothy, to Paul to encourage him in his work there. Um, Titus is a pastor in, on the island of Crete in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And so now Paul is writing a letter to Titus to encourage him in the work there. Um, when we've done the background, we've talked a lot about uh, kind of the differences between Titus and Timothy. Uh, these letters all kind of uh, 
happen around the same time towards the end of Paul's life. Um, and so they're very um, encouraging letters in some way. Um, as you can imagine, as the gospel began to spread further west across Asia Minor and then over towards Macedonia and eventually towards Europe, as the gospel began to spread and be planted, of course there was going to be baby Christians whose faith needed to be bolstered by strong biblical teaching. There was going to be um, melting pots of religion in places like Ephesus and Crete, these two places where these two men are serving, um, uh, where religious thought was coming into those areas. And some of that would be very um, anti-Christian, would be you know, doctrinally very unsound. There were false teachers that had kind of infiltrated those areas. So you can see the need for him to write these letters uh, to these young pastors encouraging them. Um, both, both Titus and First and Second Timothy uh, deal quite a bit with um, false teaching, with encouraging Titus, encouraging Timothy about how to deal with false teaching. Now, if you'll remember, we've already studied First and Second Timothy, and when we studied those letters, I said it repeatedly throughout there, um, Paul never really identifies who the false teachers are in First and Second Timothy. He, he doesn't give us any indication. You pick up on some of their false teachings and some of the things that were being emphasized, but he never really tells you exactly who they are. So it, if you're doing background material, if you're study, studying a commentary, you're digging into some kind of background material of what's in these letters, they'll throw out suggestions. Well, what do those come from? When they say, oh, well, they were dealing with, um, you know, Gnosticism here. Or they were dealing with, you know, the, the pagan worship of the gods of the Greeks. Or, you know, where are those coming from? Well, they're, they're telltale signs they pull out of those letters. No different with Titus. We are almost 100% sure that on the Isle of Crete, a group of Judaizers had come out to that island and began to compromise the gospel. Um, that's who Paul was confronting in the book of Galatians that had covered the area of Asia Minor. Um, sir, if you'll put up that map, we can kind of show um, some of this. Um, up there kind of in that top uh, right-hand corner, you'll see Galatia. Um, if you'll go back to the larger one there. Yeah, that's okay. That one, all right? You'll see Galatia up there. Remember, Galatians was a circular letter. There were lots of churches across the region of Galatia. Galatia is a part of Asia Minor where Paul went on one of his early missionary journeys, first, second missionary journeys. He was in these areas, planted churches. They became Christians. And the Judaizers came in and they taught that in order to be saved, you had to first become a Jew. You had to be circumcised, practice Jews and laws and customs. And they were preaching a salvation by works, which Paul called a false teaching. And he combats it all the time. We'll kind of see this in tonight's study. Probably one of Paul's biggest themes that he gives us is the whole concept of amazing grace, of what grace is. Um, matter of fact, his conflict with James... Um, you know, the book of James was one of the last letters added to our canon of Scripture because it so seemed to contradict Paul's teaching about grace. And Martin Luther, the reformer, even called James an epistle full of straw. And he wouldn't accept it as a part of the canon because James emphasizes works. Without, faith without works is dead. And many early Christians thought he was teaching that you could be saved by works, by that he wasn't. Uh, I kind of, when we studied James, you know, I said it's two sides of the same coin, okay? Uh, works and grace go together, uh, but works do not save you. So Paul's emphasis on grace was so important. So that's why when these Judaizers came in, Paul was writing letters like Galatians and this one, uh, Titus, is written because the false teachers that Titus was dealing with were Judaizers, and they were very aggressive, very strong, and very confusing in what they were teaching. Um, so starting tonight in verse 11, kind of following, we're going to hear a lot of talks about grace. As a matter of fact, I think Rosemary is going to read a passage from chapter 3 in just a little bit that's also going to give us a word about grace. And so um, starting tonight, he's going to kind of start to flesh some of that out. So that's why I wanted to do some of the background material so that you understand 
kind of where we're going with that. <clears throat> Our subject um, on, the, on, on the grace of God tonight is really on, on how it works in our life. What, what, is, what does grace do? What, why is grace so important? Why do we talk about it? You know, in our churches, we throw that term around a lot. We are saved by grace. We sing that beautiful song, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And, and we talk about that a lot. And, and so I wonder sometimes when we use words like that, have we really kind of lean into understanding what it is, how it works, what it makes, the difference it makes in our life, why it's so important for us. Um, and he's going to get into that tonight, even with Titus, and tell him essentially why you need to emphasize the grace of God, why grace is so important and why it needs to be um, emphasized here. Um, God's grace permeated, like I said, Paul's thinking. Um, one biblical scholar said, this is D. Edmund Hybert, he said, Paul could not think of Christian truth and conduct uh, could not think of Christian truth and conduct anything apart from God's grace. He, he, every time you hear Paul talking, he's going to somehow bring grace into it. We'll see that in some of the scriptures that we're going to be looking at a little bit later. And another um, scholar, Donald Guthrie, says, the expression, the grace of God, may fairly be said to be the key word of Paul's theology. Um, he cannot think of Christian salvation apart from the grace of God. He emphasized it so strongly. Now, we get to stand back and look at the big picture. And we can go, why did God call Paul to the work he called Paul to when he started advancing the gospel? And it started spreading across Asia Minor and then into Macedonia and then further west because Paul was a man who taught grace. Now, why do you think that was so important to Paul? Grace. Just think about Paul for a minute. Had Paul experienced grace? Why would it be so big to him? Because he was, he was persecuting the Christians and then had his uh, uh, experience on the road to Damascus. Yeah. So he, he knows firsthand what grace is. Yeah. I mean, he was, remember who Paul was. Paul was Saul, right? And, and he was a Jew among Jews. He was so zealous and, and that he even thought persecuting Christians, persecuting who he thought were anti-Jewish, persecuting them would get him to heaven. I mean, he was obeying the law. He was working at it. He was a moral man. He, he, and he was chasing false teaching out, he thought. But what did God do on that Damascus road? Yeah, he showed him grace, right? He showed and. And from that day on, Paul's life was characterized by grace. And, and that's, that's powerful. Uh, Paul went to Jerusalem at one point and fought with the disciples for grace. Stood up to the disciples about grace. And so it's a, it's a key thought to him that we cannot miss. And I want to I take you, kind of mark your place there in Titus, if you would. And we're going to kind of just flip back for a second to Romans um, of all of Paul's writings, and you know Paul wrote the largest portion um, of our New Testament, um, Romans to me is his manifesto. It's, it's, I would call that Paul's doctrinal statement. And if I was going to ever preach through a book, I would want to try to preach through Romans, but guys, it would take me two years to get through that. So um, when you get ready to study Romans and you're really brave and you come to me and say, can we study Romans on a Wednesday night? then just know we're going to be there for quite some time, okay? But Romans is, is one, is, is I, I think it's Paul's manifesto. It's, it's his strongest doctrinal treatise, statement about things. Um, and there's this passage that I want you to see because to me, the statement he makes here about grace really starts to help us understand what grace is. So Romans chapter five, I want you to go there. And I'll lay some groundwork for you. Whereas we talk about these other letters of Paul, some of them have more doctrine, theology in them than others. Romans is all theology. I mean, it is a theology book. Um, so Romans chapter five, just look at, we'll just look at the first two verses. I really could read on down through um, about verse 11 here and just spend the night kind of talking about what he's talking about here. Um, but I want to just look at the first two verses 
um, so that you see this and helping us to really get our head around what is grace? Why was it so important to him? What, what's he talking about? So um, just some background here. Notice that chapter five starts with the word therefore. So you got to back up into chapter three, I mean, chapter four to see what he was talking about. Just prior to this, he was talking about being justified by faith, uh, being made right with God. So to be justified means that you've been saved and made right with God by faith, okay? So um, look at verse one of chapter five. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, since we've been made right with God by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace um, in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's a very important passage, okay? And boy, there's so much rich doctrine right there in that passage. Look at it one more time. Therefore, having been justified by faith, since we've been made right by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also, in, in other words, through Jesus also, um, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Come on in, Robin. You're just fine. Very important to think. If you remember a, a few weeks ago, actually about two Sundays ago, in our Beatitude study, we talked about peace, remember? And, and we talked about being peacemakers and, and what it meant to be when it talks about peace and, and the peace we've been shown and that we often think of the word of, of peace as serenity or, or calmness. But that's not the word that Paul liked to use because he heard Jesus say, blessed are the peacemakers, right? And, and, and we've been shown peace. And if you notice in the first part of this verse, it says we have peace with God. And remember what I told you, the real understanding of that word is that's, that's a word of warfare that has to do with two warring parties who have signed a peace treaty. Do you remember me telling you that? That's this word. Now, if you look at it, you can see it. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. A peace tree has been signed. Through who? The Lord Jesus Christ, who also gave us access by faith into grace. And look what it says, in which we stand. And since we stand in it, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So that is such a rich statement because it's saying that Grace is something that we're given by Jesus Christ when he died on a cross for us and grace doesn't go away. It's a free gift and we can stand in it forever and have hope in the glory of God. Do you, do you see what he's telling us? So, so that's a good definition and understanding of grace when you think about it. That one word kind of teaches us a the truth there. So I wanted to start with that because I want you to write a definition of grace. But here's the parameters, all right? It's on your page there. You cannot use the words unmerited favor of God, all right? Now, you know why I'm saying that, right? Because that's the first thing that pops out of everybody's mouth. Grace is the unmerited favor of God, all right? I want you to rephrase it. I read the Romans passage. Paul's kind of t telling us about grace. And, but I want you to write a definition, And you can't use the words, the unmerited favor of God. Although that is a good definition, it would be plagiarism for you to use it. <laughs> okay. Anybody, you don't have to share, but anybody that would like to, tell me what you wrote down. Tell me what you, how you defined grace. gift that's undeserved okay what else what'd you write i gave you some parameters there so you get you're not getting to use your favorite words i know <laughs> 
Okay. Okay. Good. Anybody else? You know, the two big words that we use in the Christian faith often when we talk about salvation is grace and mercy. And I think Rosemary used the word mercy just then. And many people say those two terms, and, and I've given these, this to you before, but those two terms are kind of, you know, like what we said a while ago with James and his idea about works and Paul's idea about grace. The words grace and mercy are like two sides of the same coin. Mercy means... Um, that, that you and I are not going to get what we deserve. Remember when we talked about blessed are the merciful. We're not going to get what we deserve. Because we are sinners, and we're all sinners by nature and by choice, what we deserve is judgment, death, and hell because of our sin. But we're not going to get that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's mercy. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is grace, which means we get what we don't deserve, okay? That's the other side. So we're not going to get what we don't deserve. That's mercy. But we are going to get what we don't deserve, right? We're going to get grace. We're going to get salvation. We're going to get eternal life. We're going we're to get the promises of God. And that's a pretty healthy understanding of grace. Um, you might define it like that. God giving us what we don't deserve based on his attributes, his love, his goodness, his forgiveness, his mercy. Um, and that word becomes very important in Scripture. It, it, it's the whole basis of the doctrine of salvation is based in grace. So when we talk about how it works, we need to get our head around it. And there's so many places where Paul talks about, about grace. And I'm going to steal some thunder here because Blaine's going to read this Scripture in just a little bit, but I'm just going to quote it for you, and, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit. Listen close to these words because you're familiar with them. Paul would write in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now think about that verse for just a second. It's up there, all right? Um, who is grace from? God. That's really key, key okay? Um, that verse is so important because we need to understand that grace comes from God, not from what you do. It's not based on grace that we've received is not something you can earn, you can work for, you can deserve, you can, otherwise it wouldn't be grace. It's just, use the word gift while ago. It's just the gift of God for by grace you've been saved. All right. Another passage is Romans 6.23, kind of still in somebody else's thunder because they're going to read this in the context of another verse in just a moment or one like it. Um, For the wages of sin of, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is interesting because I want you to see it. The word grace is the, in Greek is the word charis or charis. Um, the word gift in Greek is the word charis or charis. They're interchangeable. So you could read Romans 6.23 as the wages of sin is death, but the grace of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we are saved by grace. That's how important grace and the doctrine of grace is for us. That's how important it was on the island of Crete where false teachers had come in, where Paul's writing to Titus and saying, in the things that we heard last week, ground the older men. Ground the younger men. Ground the older women in Scripture. Ground the younger women in Scripture. Ground your elders, your teachers in Scripture, the truth of it, and ground them in the grace of God because grace works, okay? And, and that's what we're going to see tonight. And in the passage that we read a minute ago, we saw that as a believer, if you're a Christian who's been saved, you stand in that grace, okay? So, Here's a true or false question. We'll put this up there and you guys just tell me what you think. Think about this, this statement. Is it true or is it false? Christians are constantly moving in and out of a state of God's grace. What did Paul say? Now, Christians are constantly moving in and out of a lot of things, right? We get ourselves in trouble. 
and then we clean up our act, and then we get ourselves back in trouble. But where are we constantly standing? In grace. That's a false statement. If you're a Christian, grace is so important to you because that's God's work in you to hold you right in the center of where you need to be as a believer, regardless of where you are right now in your walk. Close, far, struggling, walking. You see what I'm saying? So that becomes really important when you're reading. Now, here's some definitions of grace. Just some of these are, are more secular. I'll give you a quote here, and then we'll kind of look at the grace acrostic. And, and I, this is something you've heard many, many times, but I want to flesh it out for you and get you to understand what it's talking about. Um, so Webster's defi- D- Dictionary defines grace as, and you can fill this out on your page, the unmerited divine assistance given man for his regeneration and sanctification. Don't you love it when Webster's gives you a definition and you have to look up the words in the definition? <laughs> you go, okay, I hear your definition, but I don't even understand the words you're using. I need a dictionary for the definition. Um, the unmerited divine assistance, I mean, un, yeah. Um, and so that kind of fits with our definition, un, the unmerited favor of God, the undeserved favor of God. I think Keith used the word undeserved a while ago. Um, but then he says, given for man's regeneration and sanctification. Those are two big words. Um, what does it mean to be regenerated? Made new. Made new. We recognize that word as Christians, right? We don't have to look it up. We understand that we're made new by grace. All right? And what does it mean to be sanctified? Set apart. Set apart made holy and set apart for his purposes. You see, that, even that Webster's Dictionary definition is, is really pretty spiritual and that it's helping us to understand exactly what grace is. John MacArthur says, grace is God's unmerited favor, but he doesn't stop there, by which he saves us and makes us righteous. It's based solely on his sovereign love, which is manifested in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. It is not the result of any worthiness on our part. Once we are saved, we stand in grace. That's beautiful. And you need to realize that tonight, you know, before we even leave this place tonight, you need to leave here just rejoicing that no matter where you are, you stand in that grace, in the grace that God has given to you, um, whatever you've been doing. Now, here's the acrostic we always give for grace, and you can jot this down there. Um, grace has kind of been defined this way using an acrostic. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. And you read that kind of right at face value, and I wanted you to write it down because that's really a pretty good understanding of grace, but more than a definition, it's fleshing out for you what grace really is. That is, you and I are not ever going to be righteous on our own. And remember, we define righteousness as being rightly related to God. In the garden... Our right relatedness to God was broken by sin. Once Adam and Eve sinned, sin sin entered the human race, and our relationship with God was separated. And and we are not righteous on our own ever. And, And man will never be righteous on his own. We are unrighteous. And so when people talk about, you know, this righteousness or they act self righteous, you know, all that's that's false. That there's none righteous, no, not one. That's what Paul said, okay? So when we say God's righteousness, it said, it's saying to you that a right relationship with God has been given to you. Grace is a right relationship has been given or gifted or graced to you. You've been given a right relationship with God at whose expense? Jesus's. Now you understand the gospel. That's the gospel. God sent his son to die on a cross. He had never sinned. He was completely righteous in and of himself. He went to a cross and died for us at our expense. So when you look at that acrostic, that's a pretty good understanding of grace and what we've received, okay? Now, um, let's kind of, Dig in just one more thing before we kind of get to our passage, okay? Um, God's grace today, when we talk about grace, it gets distorted, I think, a lot of times. It gets cheapened. And I'm going to tell you a couple of ways that that happens, but um, 
I think sometimes today when we talk about grace, and this is why I think, you know, just a Bible study on the amazing grace of God would be a great study to spend a few weeks in, really kind of talking about what Scripture just has to say about grace. But I think today in our way of thinking, grace gets very confused. One reason is, and this is on your page there, um, the reason I think it gets polluted or distorted or warped or twisted or however you want to say it is that it is counter to the world's way. Think about that. On one side, grace runs counter to the way the world works. So it's difficult sometimes for people to get their head around it. The world works almost always on a merit system. Almost everywhere, if you think about it. If you do well in school, you get good grades, right? If you work hard, you get commended for working hard. You get better pay. You get promotions. You see, the world system works not on grace. It works on merit. So grace gets really confused, I think, in our world. It's, it's one of the reasons that we have a hard time getting our head around it. Even some major branches of Christianity, and I could name them, teach this system of merit-based salvation. Okay, do you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you do this, 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 and this, if you go to confession so many times, if you pay penance so many times, if you do this, this, and this, God will like you better. Listen to me, that's a lie. God could not like you any more than he likes you right now, no matter who you are. If you're a believer, you stand in grace, right? But, but just think about how, why grace sometimes for us is a difficult one. Because we're so based on merit, we, we think of everything that way. Um, the other reason is because sometimes Grace is viewed as cheap. In other words, sometimes in our world today, it's viewing God's grace as an opportunity for license. You see, if I'm, if I'm saved by grace, I can't lose it. I stand in it. I can live any way I want to because I'm saved by grace. It can't be taken from me. I stand in it. Do you see what I'm saying? And sometimes it's used as license to say, it's okay if I sin. It's okay if I compromise here. It's okay if I messed up. I'm saved and I know that I am and I can never lose it. It's that whole once saved, one, always saved thing, right? Which, which we believe. We believe in eternal security, but grace should never be seen as a license to sin, God forbid. Right? That's, that's taking for granted his death on a cross. So, so you have to understand that grace, the pure teaching of what grace in it is, is what Paul's after for the church in Galatia, for, for the church in, in, Crete, in Crete. And he wants them to be grounded to understand. Because here's what they're going to hear from the false teachers. Grace is, is cheap. You have, you have to work hard. You have to, be, you have to be circumcised. You have to obey these laws and customs. You have to do this work. You have to go faithfully. You have to give faithfully. You have to serve faithfully. You have to do all of these things. Otherwise, God's not going to like you and save you. That's the merit system, right? Or, well, grace is just, that's just cheap. That means you can live any way you want to. That's just an excuse for you to be a, for a, a license for sin. It's an excuse for you to go out and sin all you want to, be as rough as you want to, because you think you're saved by grace, right? And so that's what Paul, what Paul is telling Titus. You've got to understand what grace is and be grounded in grace and you've got to teach it to the people of the island of Crete or they're going to become subjected to the false teaching of the Judaizers who were there. So that's where this comes from, all right? So let's go to our passage. Let's leave Romans, go back to Titus. And I want you to look at Titus chapter 11. And he's going to tell us about grace. What, I'm sorry, chapter two, verse 11. Thank you, Lorelai. I'm so glad you're up here close. I need somebody up here close that can keep me straight because I get off sometimes. Titus chapter two, and we're going to be in verses 11 through 14 tonight, kind of continuing on there. But, you know, as I said, we're now up to the part where he's going to start to bring home what's really the topic on Paul's mind, and, and it's, it's grace. It's the strengthening this whole understanding of what grace is, and I think we need that too in our day. So beginning in verse 11, look at it. Here's what Paul writes to Titus. He wants him to be grounded in grace. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us 
that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That passage, verses 11 through 14, is a very rich doctrinal statement about grace and what it is. Um, It's not cheap. It's not a license to sin. And we need to understand what this grace is that we stand in as believers every day. I think it, it, it gives us hope. It, it gives us a reason every day to be who he's called us to be as Christians because of the grace that's been extended to us. Paul shows that God's grace first saves and then trains his people for godliness. And it's both of those. That's why I said well while ago that Paul and James were in agreement. Faith without works is dead. Grace is authenticated by works. That you're, the grace of God is real in your life and that the regeneration, the change has come is by the fruit, by the works that come when you've experienced the grace of God. So, so that's, that's very important. Um, now, the word for at the beginning of verse 11 will link that back to the verses that he just said in the previous verses in, 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 in Timothy chapter 2, verses 1, 1 through 10, where, where we were last week, where we were kind of looking at that, where Paul has shown that various groups of believers should beautify their, their lives in godliness and good deeds so as to attract others to the Savior. Well, what's the foundation of that? It's the grace of God that saved us. That's the foundation. It's, it's that we've been saved by grace. So let me give you these. These are the three ways that grace works that are kind of fleshed out in verses 11 through 14. Um, Number one, God's grace brings salvation to all people. Look at verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What brings salvation? How are we saved? By grace, right? For the grace of God brings salvation. All right, God's grace brings salvation to all people, verse 11. Then here's number two. God's grace trains the saved, those who have experienced salvation by grace. God trains the saved in godliness. Grace trains us in godliness. When we get what we don't deserve, what change should that make in us? How should that change how we live? When we are given what we didn't deserve. How should it change our relationship with God? How should it change how we look at Him? How should it change how we live every day? How does grace train us, think about that, um, in godliness? Yeah. Don't, don't you think, you know, when you understand grace and what God has done for you, don't, don't you think it changes how you live in relationship to Him? That you spend the rest of your life feeling indebted to Him, to live for Him. It's not that you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to earn His favor. He's already given it to you when you didn't deserve it. So what does that do in your relationship with Him? It makes you love him more. It makes you want to be more like him. In other words, it makes you want to be more godlike, godly, right? That's this one. God trains the saved in godliness. Look look at verse 12, and I'll read on down to the first part of verse 14. So here's what grace that brings salvation that's appeared to all men does. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts We should live soberly, genuinely, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Do you see see what I'm saying? Is that once you've you've experienced that grace, that that undeserved favor of God that you did not deserve, now 
Couple that with mercy, I'm not going to get what I deserve. I'm getting what I don't deserve, and I'll spend the rest of my life living for him because of it. You see, living godly for him. And then number three, God's grace trains the saved to be zealous for good deeds. And that's the last part of verse 14. But look at verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The reason I love this passage of scripture and its understanding of grace is it helps us to understand how grace and works fit. You see, works don't come before the grace, good works. Grace produces the good works in us. Do you see that? And, and that's key. What, what, what were the Judaizers teaching? The opposite. Good works, these works in your life, produce the favor of God, grace. No. Grace comes from him. And because we recognize he's given us what we don't deserve, we're going to spend the rest of our life living for him. Um, that's, that's key. Now, if we're just going to flesh these out some and kind of go through each one of these, let, let's think about that for just a second. Um, God's grace brings salvation to all people. That's in verse 11. Think about this. What, what are some of the ways today that people sometimes think they can be saved? What, what are some of the ways that people today think that they might be made right with God and go to heaven or can be saved? What, what do y'all know of that? What, what are some ways people think they might be saved? Be nice. be nice. Go to church. I heard that. If your parents went to church, legacy Christians. <laughs> okay, they think just by helping people. I heard a bunch over here. Blaine, you said something. Being generous. I would say that the majority of Americans think they get, you get to heaven by being good. If you're good. Yeah. What else? Anything else? I'm just going to tell you that religion plays a big role in it. Some people think that if I'm religious, if I do religious things, if I do, I'll be made right with God. So you've got to think about that. Um, but, but Paul wants us to understand here, and he minces no words about it, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Um, salvation comes by the grace of God, not by how good you are. not by. So we have to understand what that is. And this is where I want to read your passages, okay? Um, and just listen to these and, 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 and think about this each time. Listen really closely as they're read. They'll, they'll come up on the screen. They might be in a different translation than what y'all are reading because the, the verse on the screen will be from the New King James, okay? But um, listen close, and some of them will be familiar, but I want you to hear over and over and over again in Scripture. You will never hear in Scripture, anywhere in Scripture, that you are saved by works, by religion, by what you do, by being moral, by any of those things, but you will hear over and over again in Scripture what Paul is affirming to Titus here, that is the grace of God that brings salvation. So listen for it. This is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 again, and Blaine's going to read that one. Okay. Very powerful. You see, very clearly states. You're, you're, there you go. Thank you. Um, for by grace you're saved. You see it? It's, it's explicitly stated there. The next one is a short one, and I think Marsha's going to read this one. This is just Acts 15, 11. This is, I don't like to pull verses out of context here, but just for the sake of time, I did. That This is a, is a very important statement that's being made here in the book of Acts. So read this one for us in verse 11 of Acts 15. Okay. Clearly. We believe that we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, ju just as they are, just as anybody else is. That's, that's the only way that a person is saved. All right, I just want you to see these. Uh, Romans 3, and Bessie has this one, 23 and 24. This is a good verse. We quote... Romans 2.23, that should say 3.23, that's a typo. Uh, 
we quote Romans 3.23 all, all the time, and, and, and it's, we quote it in a negative way almost. Uh, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when you read that, you go, oh me, it's true. But the full context of that verse, notice that uh, when it transitions from verse 23 to 24, it's a comma. It should be, there were no original verse markings. This would have been read as one statement because he's telling us good news here. Look at it. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's offering us hope. How are we saved? We're all sinners, it's saying, but how are we saved? By grace, through the redemption of Christ. Now the next two are a little bit lengthier verses. Titus 3 will be to this before too long. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, Rosemary is going to read this one to us a little bit longer. But listen to these verses because they are fluid. I mean, beautiful. L listen to them. <laughs> You see that? Beautiful. How important grace is. It's everything for us. We stand in that. All right, and one more. Um, and Diane's going to read this one from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. A couple of very important statements in there. Um, but I want you to see that passage of Scripture. And, and the reason that I wanted to show you all of these is that in our passage in Titus, Paul just makes this one simple little statement there. Um, and, and, I, and I love the way um, that he words that in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's, God has presented us with his free gift. And what do you do to receive a free gift? You take it. You accept it. And we use language in Baptist churches sometimes. We talk about accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And we don't put that in any context. But what we're saying to is accept the gift. Accept the gift that he's offering. That passage said it was before time that this gift was purposed for us. And we must accept the grace gift. You know, that's all we do. And once we accept the gift of salvation from him by grace, we stand in that. And that's so grounding. And so that's, that's the truth that he's talking about there. So the grace of God um, is what saves us. And then that second thing, we talked about how it trains us um, for godliness. Let me, let me give you this because this is important. Look at verses 12 through 14 of our passage again. I want you to see this because he's going to talk about it. Um, we have a hard time connecting grace and works. We have a hard time with it because when we start talking about works, it sounds like we're saying you're saved by works. You are never saved by works. That's why I wanted you to read the verses. It, scripture never frames it like that. You are saved by grace, but the outflow of grace will be a life that's changed how you live, okay? So, so look what he says. Um, and and it, verse 12 starts with the word teaching, but it refers back to what is grace when we're saved, teaching us. It's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, you see, we recognize when we're saved by grace, we're getting what we don't deserve because we know what worldly lusts are. We were a part of that. That's us. Um, we know what ungodliness is. It was a part of, we were a part of that, but we got what we don't deserve, right? Grace. So it's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in the present age. That is right now while we're living. 
looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So the word teaching there is, means child training. That's an interesting word in the Greek language. It means it's like child training. It's, it's teaching us how to walk, teaching us how to live. Grace is training us how to be who he's called us to be. Sometimes we say, you know, we're to extend to others the same grace we've been shown. We say it like that. We're, we're, we're to love others with the grace we've experienced. There's this training process with it. Now, three ways that grace trains us. And he says it right here in this passage in verse 12. Grace trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. That's what he says. That's, that's important. What does he mean by that? Well, I already gave you a hint when I was talking about it. When we recognize the grace we have been shown when we did not deserve it, it teaches us to deny those things, to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly passions. Do we still struggle with them? Yes, but we stand in grace, in his grace, when we do, and we recognize, and we're broken over it, right? Every single time, the conviction of the Spirit causes us to recognize it, and we come right back to him, recognize what is grace doing then it's teaching us all the time i don't know but it's almost it's a daily thing with me sometimes you know grace is telling buddy to shut his mouth you know do, do you see what i'm saying you can see that so that, that that's the first way is that it it it, it teaches us to deny and godliness. second of all grace trains us to live sensibly righteously and godly in this present age teaches us to do that. Um, it's not enough to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires. It's not enough. You've got to say yes to godly desires. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not enough to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Okay, well, what are you going to do then? I'm going to live godly for Christ. I want to live a life that pleases him. Uh, you know, I I mean, we've been saying it with our series again on Sundays. I want to live a life that God applauds, that pleases Him. Um, that's what He's saying there. Trains us to live a life sensibly, righteously, godly before Him. And those are all very important words. Uh, this word sensibly in my Bible, some, some Bibles maybe say soberly, maybe another translation that you have there. Um, it means self-controlled. It means brought brought under control of something. It's that whole idea of meekness that we talked about. Recognizing, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm constantly walking back into ungodliness and those kind of things. I want to live my life differently by your grace. You see, <clears throat> the word righteously means living in right relatedness with him. Living as he would have us live. Godly means a Godward life, looking like him. But then there's this third way that grace trains us. Um, and, and I like this one. Grace trains us to live in godliness by looking ahead and looking behind. Both are important. Grace trains us to look forward to his appearing. That one day we will be with him. So by, we can live by grace every single day knowing that we are his and one day we'll be in his presence but also looking behind. And, and if you look at verses 13 and 14, you'll see this. He, he says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's looking ahead. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem for us from every lawless deed. That's looking behind us. And purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. So you, you see the two sides of that, that, that idea that we are looking ahead, but we're also looking behind at the ways we failed and how we want to live godly for him today, okay? So that's that picture, all right? And we're almost done, guys. I'm trying to get to it. I um, want to kind of conclude tonight in a different way. Um, I've shared this with some of you before, but um, I love to read anything that Elizabeth Elliot ever wrote. Uh, she was one of my heroes of the faith. Um, she's the one whose husband, uh, Jim Elliott, at a very young age, was a missionary to the Aka Indians, and he was speared to death. So there's been some movies made about that. Um, in the Shadow of the Almighty, 
is one of her books. Um, great, great. If you ever have a chance to read anything by Elizabeth Elliot, read that. Um, one of the books that she wrote is Nothing But His Diary. Um, and he made some great statements that I love. And I'm going to close, instead of with four points here, I'm going to close with four Jim Elliott quotes on the motivation of grace in our life. Okay? And I gave them to you, so you'll have them. Uh, you don't have to write anything down. If you notice that, you don't have to write too much. I gave you lots of cheat notes in there. Um, so let me just share these with you. I want you to think about them. This will kind of be our closing thing. So kind of our closing four statements. Um, at the age of 22, Jim Elliott wrote this. This is number one. I see clearly now that anything, whatever it is, if it be not of the principle of grace, it's not of God. 22. There's some depth in that statement if you think about it. In other words, he, he came to grips with what the grace of God was and he began to reflect in his own life and the things in this world that whatever is not of grace is not of God. That's a powerful statement. Then regarding living in light of the second coming, at age 20, now we're younger, he wrote to his 15-year-old sister these words. Fix your eyes, now he's 20 years old, fix your eyes on the rising morning star. Live every day as if the Son of Man were at the door and gear your thinking to the fleeting moment. Walk as if the next step would carry you across the threshold of heaven. Who thinks like that as a 20-year-old? <laughs> but, but do you see the reliance on grace and, and the God's grace that he stands in there? The third one is, again, he's 22 years old and he wrote these words. How poorly will appear anything but a consuming operative faith in the person of Christ when he comes. How lost, alas, a life lived in any other light. I only want to live in the grace of God to please for him at 20. And then his entire life portrayed intense zeal for the Lord and his work. He wrote um, through the gates of splendor a quote in that book. He said, Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. And those four statements to me kind of reflect a person who recognized they were standing in God's grace. Very powerful. That's how God's grace works. Um, it saves us and then trains us for godly living. It, it didn't tell me. It didn't tell me, but... All those others, he was in his 20s. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Great, great little study. Going to be a lot of talk about grace through the rest of the book. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of move on from there. So thank you guys for coming. Blaine, so good to have you with us tonight. I wish you weren't traveling or you could just travel right back in here with us again. So <laughs> yeah, we would love it. Let me lead us in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. 102. Good, good. Do y'all have a crowd, Nancy, over there tonight? Do you know, do you know how many kid, kiddos? I don't know. I don't even remember. Okay. All right, let me pray. Father, thank you for this time tonight for us to be together to share and, and, and just to marvel in your amazing grace. God, I, my prayer is that even tonight in this place, we, we would be humbled, humbled by the grace that you have poured out in our life. God, we recognize, Father, that we are saved by that amazing grace of yours, what you've given us when we did not deserve it. And God, we should spend the rest of our lives to your glory honoring you. And God, we may drift and we may roam and we may mess up and fall away at times, God, but we stand every day in your grace by the promise of your word. Help us to see that. And God, I thank you for this study that we're in right now as we delve into Titus. God, we keep pulling out these precious nuggets, reminders of who you are and how you work. May that grow us up in you to be who you've called us to be, to be the witness you've called us to be, to make a difference where you've planted us, Father, by faith. God, may you use our lives to call others into your amazing grace.
Bless us as we go from this place tonight to your glory. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, guys.